countries under IMF programs have to meet the lenders' targets or requirements. But you know, when that becomes a painful sacrifice, no government can withstand riots and protests. And especially in a democracy like Kenya, where you can easily be vote, the government can be voted out in the next election, or citizens can take to the streets, as we've seen, to protest and demand that you know, some of these measures be reversed. And hence, we've seen President Ruto make some concessions in recent weeks. Read the room. That would be my two cents for political leaders in 2024. Now, Kenya's president, William Ruto, learned this the hard way. More than 50 people were killed when Gen Z-led protesters flooded the streets of Nairobi. And it was sparked by a controversial proposed financial bill through which the government aimed to raise an extra $2.7 billion in revenue. Now the protest is forced through to his hand, the bill was recalled, the cabinet was disbanded, they now have a new cabinet. But the thing is, this legislation formed part of an agreement with the IMA for $3.7 billion. And this agreement kind of hangs in the balance. So Kenya really finds itself stuck between a rock and a hard place. Do you add the financial pressures on your people or do you adhere to a loan agreement? And it's tough. It's a tough call. You also don't just go to the IMA for frilly nilly reasons. It must mean that your economy is busy drowning. To give further insight into Kenya's economy, I'm joined by ETM Analytics' co-head for Africa, Takuzo Nduwana. Tux, thank you very much for joining me on Markets Magnified again. So what is the economic snapshot of Kenya currently? Oh, thanks for having me, Elsa. The economic outlook is worrying at present. Uh, you know, the removal of the finance bill um, has led to complications in Kenya's fiscal consolidation efforts in the sense that now the government is facing higher than expected budget deficits for the current fiscal year. And this budget deficit has already been revised twice uh, from an initial estimate of around 3.3% of GDP to now 4.2% of GDP. And in order to plug that fiscal gap, you know, President Ruta has come out saying that he intends to reduce spending as well as increase borrowing. Where these spending cuts will come from, it remains unclear at present, but we'll probably expect them to come from development spending. Kenya's inability to raise funding is worrying, given that they face a significant looming external debt repayments over the next decade. And more so, Kenya spends around 75% of its income on servicing debt. And we recently had an economic advisor to the president forecasting that Kenya requires 20, needs to service debt worth $26 billion over the next 10 years. And that excludes interest of like $1.5 billion annually. So really a very tough economic spot that, that Kenya finds itself in. But of course, this is not unique to Kenya. And we, we chose Kenya to, to highlight this problem because it is so current and it, it is grabbing headlines, the situation that's playing out. But it's just an example of these African states forced to be making economic progress, but perhaps trying to do so too quickly. Yeah, definitely, Ilza. I mean, this is a perfect example of the narrow and rocky parts that African governments have to face. I mean, the finance bill was a critical component of the fiscal reforms demanded by the IMF. And countries under IMF programs have to meet the lenders' targets or requirements. But, you know, when that becomes a painful sacrifice, no government can withstand riots and protests. And especially in a democracy like Kenya, where you can easily be vote, the government can be voted out in the next election, or citizens can take to the streets, as we've seen, to protest and demand that, you know, some of these measures be reversed. And hence, we've seen President Ruto make some concessions in recent weeks. You know, and we saw how deep the consequences can run. Uh, you know, Ruto didn't just stop at having to pull the bull. He had to disband his entire cabinet and form a new one, um, which, by the way, I read this morning, the activists are still not entirely happy with. So I don't know where the protest might actually continue further in Kenya. But, you know, my thinking is also that surely the IMF and other international lenders, as well as other African states that find themselves in a similar situation, will be taking a leaf out of Kenya's book to say, you know what, this is not how to do it. Um, and I'm wondering whether or not we could see amendments come from this. Uh, definitely, Ilza. As in, case, in Africa, most countries rely on concessional funding from the likes of the IMF. And so they will be closely watching developments in Kenya. You know, um, they'll be worried that they would have to implement reforms and face the same hostility that's been seen in Kenya. So, yes, they'll definitely be taking note of what's happening in Kenya. So what are Kenya's options now out of this? 
Jeez, um, it's difficult here. The Fiscal Balancing Act has become challenging. Um, what's encouraging, though, is that Kenya's sought help from the IMF. I think uh, multilateral funding from the IMF and the World Bank is important for Kenya to meet its external debt needs over the next couple of years. And as of this week, the Treasury sent an economic repair plan a proposal to the IMF. So that's encouraging. And then locally, while it seems that the protests are suggesting that there's not much Kenya can do to raise funding or find a solution that's, you know, politically palatable. Um, if there were just to be able to squeeze just a little bit more revenue, it would put the de- Kenya's debt on a sustainable path. But President Ruto has to be able to balance this in the sense that he has to find measures that will be palatable or be accepted by the protesters. You know, in a worst case scenario, Kenya could be forced to restructure its debt, as in the case of Ghana or Zambia. So a lot to watch out for still in Kenya and how the situation really plays out. But um, hopefully in an upcoming podcast, we will also be looking at these type of frameworks that's supposed to assist African states, but it's really just not an effective solution. And that maybe lenders should be looking at a different blueprint to assist these economies. Tux, thank you very much for your time and we will chat again soon.